upon this southern plain through swamp and middle land like thunder lightning Viewing a map of Opelousas and Atakapa, the most remarkable features in their geography are the prairies. Here you behold those vast herds of cattle which afford subsistence to the natives and to the inhabitants of the city of New Orleans. It is certainly one of the most agreeable views in nature to behold, from point of elevation, thousands of horses and cows of all sizes scattered over the interminable mead, intermingled in wild confusion. When we estimate the extent of ground that must forever remain covered with grass, it is no extravagant declaration to call this one of the meadows of America. William Darby, 1803. This vast meadow of America, along with liberal grazing laws, allowed ranching to flourish in South Louisiana in the 18th and 19th centuries. The Atacapa and Opelousas trading posts were established as early as the 1730s. Early Europeans traveled from New Orleans with slaves to tend to these posts. On their return, it was the slave who was left behind to form business and personal relationships with the Native American cattle and horse traders in the region. Even before the Acadians arrived and transformed the cattle industry, these slaves became the first vacheurs, or ranchers, in the territory. Before the Civil War, an estimated 70,000 cattle roamed au large, no fences confining them. They grazed all year round on the two and a half million acres of prairie grass. Even people without land found opportunity in the cattle business. <laughs> Horses were valued for their use in herding. Horsemen led the cattle to graze, moving with the seasons to follow the grass. Since all cattle roamed together, branding took the place of fences, separating one owner's cattle from his neighbors. Horsemanship became a way of life. Symbolically, horses have historically signified social status and wealth, while also marking man's capacity to control other animals, domesticating them for his needs. Conquerors are often memorialized in equestrian statues and paintings. For the plantation slave, an overseer on horseback represented power and dominance, the horse a means of escape. For many of Louisiana's black men, horses can still be associated with freedom and independence, work and respect. And on the vacheries of the prairies, everybody was on horseback. Oral histories, public records, and branding books identify the early ranchers in the Atacapa and Opelousas areas as Indians, women, and gens de couleur libre, or free people of color. Together, these people formed what is called the Creole population. This is the birth of some of America's first cowboys, French, Black, and Indian. Today, only a few ranches remain on Louisiana's vanishing prairie. Yet, despite the passing of time, many Creole descendants maintain small farmsteads and a love affair with their horses. My dad and usually about four black cowboys would take care of that whole ranch pretty much year round. When he needed cowboys to bring to the ranch to stay there, that was gonna be their life from that moment forward. They would go to the Opelousas area and uh, bring the whole family back and load up all the belongings and uh, come back again. 
they generally always came from down east. It originally started with probably the Caesar family that came from there. So maybe it was just hard economic times and they needed a job and it was just good cowboys. My dad, uh, whose real name was Herbert Henderson, known all his life as Pete, was a ranch foreman for more years than I can count. As a kid growing up, I remember when we got our first television set. So I watched uh, The Lone Ranger and Roy Rogers and all that. Cavendish, drop that gun. And of course, I was right there where there were people really living the cowboy life, although they weren't chasing rustlers and outlaws or carrying six guns. The cattle were rough. The horses were pretty rough, and I guess you'd say the men were rough too because they had to be to do some of the things they did. Cowboy life is filled with difficulties. For marsh cowboys, the most dangerous undertaking was crossing water on their way to winter grazing. We would I load a bunch of men and a bunch of saddles and a little old wooden skiff, and we'd be overloaded, no life jackets. Half the crew couldn't swim. We all had on boots and spurs. The first black cowboys I remember were Lucian Bat Caesar and, of course, his son, Joseph Bean Caesar, and then Lucian's brother, Victorian Vic Caesar. And Vic had a son that rode at the ranch that we called Chuck Caesar. I think his real name was John. And then other than those, there was Floyd Clifton, who was known as Mano. Mano could rope really well. When he was young, he could ride any horse on the place. He was the one they primarily went to when they needed to break bad colts. He was one tough cowboy. He was uh, excellent with uh, any of the tools that the cowboys used. He could plat whips. He and the other black cowboys, they would take a uh, horse mane and tail, and they would uh, thin it out, sort it by color, and they could make horsehair reins with it. They made a lot of their own equipment. They would repair tack fix bridles, saddles, do all kinds of leather work. They were all real good with a rope. Unless it was some really wild cattle or a really huge herd, Vic Caesar was always the lead rider when we would bring the big herds of cattle. He would pretty much handle the front of the herd by himself. By most accounts, one of the best cowboys was Cyprien Césaire, a free man of color who became a prominent landowner, ranching many head of cattle. A small settlement east of Swallow was named after him, L'Ensprien Noir, meaning Black Cyprien's Cove. His descendants are still active horsemen today. I've been involved in horse ever since I was born for 72 years. I've been racing for at least 40 circuit races. So uh, I've been with horses all my life. I knew this is as invent, and uh, there was my daddy's cousin. Dad, daddy, and my daddy's was two brothers. This over here in Metro Swallow, we started that about 14 years ago. as the only track they got in Louisiana. But you're racist. I'm the best cowboy. But now, as I grow older now, you know, I don't cowboy like I used to, you know, because I can't move as fast as I used to. Everything I do now, I do it slow, and it lasts longer. Andrew Cesar is my uncle. I was a bully, and then he changed my life. He made a deal, and if I get better grades, that he was going to give me a horse. So I got my stuff together, and I got my horse. And then I came back. I was student of the year. That was it. I just come show him all my grades. And then if he say if I drop him, he take the horse back. And I kept him up ever since. Because 
uh, I see my papa doing it, and we all want to do it. Got a couple more that want to do it, but we just need the legs. Our legs need to be longer. My name is Kevin, and I live in Austin, and I'm uh, seven years old. And Uncle Andrew gave me a donkey, and he's finna give me a pony. My name is Andre Jacobs, and um, I'm 12. Uncle Andrew gave my um, my my grandpa um, a horse for the buggy. We trying to put the um for the for the um 4H. And now we uh, he just gave me another horse for my roping career. His name is Woe. Uh, he's a black and white paint, and um, we entered in a 4-H. Um, both two of those horses did very good. Me and him, we won some more awards in 4-H. That's what's up. Our history is all African American. I'm part Indian. Right. I'm on my Laura, and uh, I think oh, yes. they kind of Indian. No. It is hot. The Creole. Crazy. Well, that's all we got to say. I love Cajun. And a black man, bro. I love Cajun. <laughs> it's all crossbreed. I mean, you got the Indian, black, white, they all, they all messed up, you know. That's why you see some yellow ones, some black ones, some white ones, and green eyed ones, and whatever. Okay. Jim. Jim. Easy, go. Easy. 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 We do it every two weeks, hot or rain. And if it rained, we drink beer and eat peanut. Get out with that. You gotta just imagine a horse pulling a bicycle. And what's gonna happen with that bicycle if you don't know where that horse is going? Yeah. That's what it is. It's that light. We call it a bike. And it's just like a bicycle. I guess for uh, riding the Sogies, the first thing you got to learn the horse because each horse pulls a little different. You gotta have horse sense. You gotta be horse inclined. Thing, having the feel, the driver and the horse becoming one. To be able to sit in that buggy, because your mind, that tail is in your face. That's all your mind is just focusing on that horse. Because if he stumbles, you got to be able to lift him to, so he can stay on his feet. If you drop the line, and we, we didn't have some bad falls already. I mean, you're going to fly once that shaft hit the ground. Barely, barely. And you really feel this trailer. Here they going around that poor too. Rayfield Laverne from Bazzi. Big trail ride fan. Piney Wood, you in the woods. It's a nice ride. You can get out and you see all your family. But everybody's family at Piney Wood, I don't care. You can be white, black, Mexican. I mean, it's, everybody get along with Piney Wood, you know. Piney Wood is a trail ride, but it's a festival. The Piney Woods Trail Ride is just one of many annual Creole trail rides found on South Louisiana's landscape on just about any given weekend. Other trail rides include the 20-year-old Big Eight and the new New Step Riders, both shown here. Trail rides are the largest gatherings of Le Monde Creole, the Creole community. Je parle meilleur créole que je parle à l'anglais. I speak better at Creole than I do at English. <laughs> so we have a deep culture, a real deep culture. I'm a resident of Parks, Louisiana, and a member of the Big Eight Trail Riders Association. And the whole purpose of the trail ride organization is to preserve the black cowboy culture. Uh, I guess a cowboy is anyone who depends upon the equine uh, for uh, for a purpose. Many rides attract up to 3,000 friends, family, and social riding clubs. Emblazoned on t-shirts and horse trailers, many riders display images of their own towns and horse clubs. 
My name is Carl Jason. I'm from Opelousas, Louisiana. Being in a club, we get to do a lot more uh, just being around everybody. You know, a whole bunch of horses, just everybody having fun, loving it. Also cooking, having fun cooking. Now, this is Backbone Stew. Some's from Butchered Hog and some I went to a country butcher store today. Oh yeah, it's pretty good. Looked like it done went down because they had a lot more than that. <laughs> While on the ride, DJs provide the music, saving the live Zydeco music for the dance when they return. 80-year-old Frank Malvo, better known as Breadman from Church Point, Louisiana, is one of those DJs. Yeah, let me see you do a train ride one time. Let me see you find The truck came in very, very handy for me. As I grew older, the strength left. I don't know where did it go at, but it's gone. But uh, I can sit and play my music without any problem and not having to unload and load up the instruments like I used to do. All I do is start my generator. Breadman and riders devotedly follow most of the trail rides, as seen here in the first annual New Step Trail Ride. We are Leonville, Prairie Laurent. That's what they call it. The old people call it Prairie Laurent. Prairie Laurent is home to the legendary king of Zydeco, Clifton Chenier. Zydeco music is tightly associated with trail rides. Some Zydeco musicians embrace their Creole cowboy culture, like the late Buzu Chavis and Gino Delafosse, and sing in their Creole French. Well, you know, a lot of people, they'll look at me and going out of state, you know, you, you don't see too many black cowboys, and then they'll come and hear me play. First, they have a black guy wearing Western clothes, playing an accordion, and then when he opened his mouth, he's singing French. They've always said the best thing for the inside of a man is the outside of a horse. When you turn him out and let him run loose and run free, it's just a beautiful thing. After the leisurely parade around the community for three to four hours, the riders return to base camp to be met by a community spectators and live Zydeco music. Hello and welcome to LPB's Membership Drive. I'm John Dennison. I'm a volunteer and longtime member of LPB. And we're taking this short intermission to give you the opportunity to vote for more programs like this one by pledging your support for LPB right now. The number's right here on your screen. Call or text GIVE to 888-769-5000 or join online at lpb.org. Or now, as you can see on the screen, just scan the QR code that you see there with your smart device. We make it pretty easy, don't we? And we've just seen the first act of this wonderful documentary by filmmaker and producer Connie Castile. You're going to meet her and our other special guest in just a moment. TGALO is a term that refers to a horse moving at a slow gallop, but we're going to be moving at a quicker pace tonight because we have many things to share with you, including a member challenge from generous viewers just like you. Sally Capel, Kathleen Hargrave, George Mowbray, and Deborah Richard of Southwest Louisiana are proud to support the programs on LPB, and they are matching dollar for dollar the first $1,500 called in during this program. So a big thank you to them, and thank you for accepting this challenge by making your contribution worth twice as much to LPB. And now let's take a look at the great thank you gifts that we have for you for your pledge of support during this program. For a $20 monthly donation, you will receive the T-Gallo Combo that includes two hardcover books, Louisiana Cowboys by Bill Jones and Louisiana Trail Riders by Jeremiah Aries. Plus receive a DVD of the program you are watching, T-Gallo, A Louisiana Horse Story. This director's cut DVD includes 20 extra minutes of bonus footage not included in this broadcast. For a $10 monthly donation, receive the book Louisiana Cowboys by Bill Jones, an illustrated account of trail drives throughout the grasslands of Southwest Louisiana. 
And for $7 per month, receive a DVD of the director's cut of T. Gallo, A Louisiana Horse Story with 20 minutes of bonus footage. Or choose not to receive a gift to let 100% of your donation go to support LPB. Become a friend of LPB today by calling or texting GIVE to 888-769-5000, give online at lpb.org, or simply scan the QR code on your screen with your smart device. Thank you for supporting LPB. It's a treat to have filmmaker Connie Castile and photographer Jeremiah Aries. Uh, Connie, when this film premiered, your, your documentary was awarded Documentary of the Year by the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. Tell us why you wanted to tell these stories. I suppose when a documentary, documentary filmmaker approaches a subject, they really don't know where, what the story is yet, but growing up in Bro Bridge as a little girl, I just remember on Sundays seeing these black cowboys riding through town on their horses. And then as, you know, as continue to, to go to school, grow up there in Acadiana, starting to make these connections between all of these horseback traditions. You had Cajun jockeys, you had the Creole trail rides, you had the Tournois in Ville Platte, and it, it just kind of sparked an interest in me and in wondering why do we have all these horseback traditions that crossed Cajun and Creole culture. And then once digging into the research, uh, it seemed like that story really needed to get told to have um, the horseback traditions of Southwest Louisiana um, portrayed in a film. And it is a very lively story that's still very much alive today. Uh, Jeremiah, your book uh, that we are uh, uh, bringing into the combo package tonight, your book's called Louisiana Trail Riders, and that's a thank you gift in the package. We appreciate you autographing copies for our LPB viewers. How did you begin documenting the trail riders? Well, I'm not from Louisiana, and so uh, when I came across the trail we riders, won't hold that again. <laughs> thank you. It was very much by chance. I had uh, just been out in the country and came across a weekend trail ride, and uh, you know, I was really surprised to see all these folks, all these uh, black folks on horses. It just was a completely new vision for me. It wasn't something that I got to grow up with, but it was something that was immediately captivating and immediately challenged my conception of who a cowboy is. And I had recognized the importance of this as I started looking for um, more images, more information about this history and about this very living culture. And actually one of the, uh, the first things and one of the few things I found was actually Connie's film. And uh, she may not remember this, but I reached out to her in, in kind of giddy uh, excitement because of uh, after the first time I had encountered a trail ride and made some photographs. And so I'm very grateful for your film and your work that you've oh, done. Thank you. Uh, LPB, of course, is known for its fantastic raffles. There's a new raffle every season, and this one is particularly important as we go through this pledge drive. And here's a little bit more about why you need to get those tickets now. The future of driving is here. LPB's Win the Wheels raffle accelerates into the 21st century with a Tesla Model 3. Hi, I'm Trisha Johnson, and I'm the winner of the 2021 Win the Wheels raffle. Enter for your chance to win this hot, next-generation electric car. Every dollar raised goes to support public broadcasting and provide educational resources in your local community. Purchase a ticket for $50. Buy two and you'll get the third ticket free. You'll also receive LPB's most popular benefit, LPB Passport, giving you unlimited access to the best of PBS and LPB on demand. Go online to lpb.org slash raffle or call 888-769-5000. Can't win if you don't enter. I love my new Tesla. Thank you, friends of LPB. You are helping sustain LPB for the future, which makes you a winner and possibly the owner of a brand new Tesla. Helping LPB present more programs like this from Louisiana filmmakers who uh, share our stories. Call or text GIVE to the number on your screen or now take your smart device and just scan that QR code right there. Um, Connie, the, the other book we are offering, Louisiana Cowboys by Bill Jones. That was a pretty good resource to you and your filming. Could you give us a hint at what we'll see coming up in the film? Well, uh, the book was definitely a valuable resource, as was um, 
many other books as, and uh, people, of course, professors that their research and in interests, you know, centered around Creole culture or, or horseback traditions, especially the cattle industry um, and the origins of that. So one of the things you learn when when you go to make a uh, documentary film or documentary photography, I think, is to kind of get it right. So um, doing your research is, is really important. Certainly the film will set, starts out uh, in giving you some historical background and then we move chronologically through our horseback traditions. Okay. Jeremiah, your Louisiana Trail Riders series is exhibited in lots of places, just recently in Shreveport, uh, yeah. correct? Yeah, you know, it's uh, no surprise that Louisiana is a very special place and uh, this work has really garnered a lot of interest nationally. So when I first exhibited the photographs in 2016, it was in Nashville, Tennessee. And since then, it has really been touring around the country and has gone to a lot of different places. And, uh, some photographs have been shown in Chicago and Atlanta and uh, Duke Center for Documentary we let, Studies. We let the, the, the rest of the country discover these treasures of Louisiana. That's, That's right. Fantastic. And then uh, after a number of years, we got to bring it back here and show it uh, in, very close to where the work was made in, in southern Louisiana at the ACA in Lafayette and then most recently in Shreveport, Louisiana, which was a real treat because they had worked so hard to bring the trail riding community to make them a part of the show, to give them a platform so they weren't just uh, uh, the, uh, what was represented in the photographs, but they had a voice in that representation. Uh, they That's showed fantastic. their own photographs, they uh, showed a lot of ephemera from their culture, and it was uh, this joint effort that resulted in a trail ride that came around through downtown and to the gallery for uh, a closing reception and a block party. Wow. So it was a lot of fun. What a sight that must yeah. have been. Yeah, it was a good time. I have to uh, give one more look at our thank you gifts, Jeremiah. So let's bring that up right now before we close out this break. For a $20 monthly donation, you will receive the T Gallo combo that includes two hardcover books Louisiana Cowboys by Bill Jones and Louisiana Trail Riders by Jeremiah Aries. Plus, receive a DVD of the program you are watching. T. Gallo, A Louisiana Horse Story. This director's cut DVD includes 20 extra minutes of bonus footage not included in this broadcast. For a $10 monthly donation, receive the book Louisiana Cowboys by Bill Jones, an illustrated account of trail drives throughout the grasslands of southwest Louisiana. And for $7 per month, receive a DVD of the director's cut of T. Gallo, A Louisiana Horse Story, with 20 minutes of bonus footage. Or choose not to receive a gift to let 100% of your donation go to support LPB. Become a friend of LPB today by calling or texting GIVE to 888-769-5000, GIVE online at lpb.org, or simply scan the QR code on your screen with your smart device. Thank you for supporting LPB. And we'll hear more from Connie and Jeremiah in our next break. Big thanks to Maison Madeleine and Brobridge and Pack and Paddle in Lafayette for their generous support of LPB. Now back to the program. The Acadians, exiled from Maritime Canada, eventually made their way to South Louisiana in 1765. Isolated by geography, they maintained their language and culture while influenced by other ethnic groups in the region to become Cajun. One of the first Cajun names to appear among the official brands was Broussard. Ten generations have been in the cattle business in the Broussard family. From Joseph Beausoleil, we are direct descendants of Joseph Beausoleil Broussard, Joseph Beausoleil Broussard's grandfather, was in the cattle business in France and raised cattle in Canada. So when, he, when they moved to Louisiana, it was nothing new for him to be in the cattle business. The fleur de lis, the flower of France, and this particular brand was my great-grandfather's brand. It progressed to this type size brand, 
heavier metal. And then my father made it even heavier. And then I took it to this step, made with stainless steel, lasts a lifetime. And this brand, I just got uh, a little over a month ago. And it's, it's still the Fleur de Lis, but it's electric brand. Settling in the Atacapa and Opelousas areas, the migrating Acadians were encouraged by the colonial government through the Dotarive Compact to pursue cattle herding. It was a skill the Acadians perfected in Acadie. This encouragement is seen by some as the start of the American cattle industry. This is the copy of the original instrument but of starting the cattle industry of this nation. It explains how it came into being. The eight families that were starting the cattle industry, half of the eight were bruiserhards. <laughs> And yeah, as a young boy, I helped herd cattle and work cattle and learn how to vaccinate them and attend to them. Louisiana has good cowboys. Most most of the cowboys I know, his father was involved in the cattle business, and they grew up as a young children riding horseback and helping their daddies, just like I did and my father did. They learned to like riding horseback and working cattle. We enjoyed doing it. In this area, they got to be some of the most famous jockeys. Living side by side and shaped by their geography, Creoles and Cajuns share much. Language, food, music, and a strong connection to land and animals. Another thing they share is a deep-seated love of play. Naturally, horses are part of that. The Tour Noir was brought to Vieux-Clad by Marshal Langaron, who was a major in Napoleon's army. They kept on having this as an entertainment. Then the Tour Noir was kind of abandoned with other activities. A bush track really was what took over the, the Tour Noir. They became a part of the Cotton Festival. And along with the Cotton Festival, uh, each ring started to represent enemies of cotton instead of enemies of King George. Uh, we'd like you to tune in to KBPI at 92.5. Listening to the 2010 Tournoi here in right. Phil Plant, Louisiana. On a gorgeous day here in Phil Plant, 86 degrees, humidity only 30% right now. You don't see that barrel. No, you don't. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We welcome you to the running of the Louisiana Tournoi for this year, the year 2010. We have a beautiful weather, we have a beautiful field, and we have a beautiful crowd. So everything is uh, looking exactly like they should. And after this is all over with, we're going to be crowning a new king. Well, I grew up listening to my grandmother and my daddy talking about my grandfather. 
He had run the Tour Noir. In fact, he was the winner, and he was a horse trader. My daddy was, too, and I was interested in horses. And that's how I got interested in the Tour Noir. I started riding in 1952, and in 1967, I won the championship. I kept running until my son was in college, and he was interested in running, too, so that's when I quit. And I'm still involved with the Tour Noir. My job is the electric timekeeper. I've been doing that ever since I quit competing. Many barbecue pits going. Bill Ardway, what's going on with you? Well, I was just sitting here admiring the beautiful animals. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, some beautiful uh, horse flesh out there this afternoon. <laughs> Whoever I ride is asked for a prayer, so I just I just volunteered. And I just asked the good Lord to bless the horses, bless the riders, and just let all show good sportsmanship, good horsemanship. I'm the ringmaster for the last few years, and the ringmaster basically, he'll hand him the lance. After the rider completes his rounds, then he'll bring it back to me. We'll take the count of how many rings we have, and we'll just hand it in to the scorekeepers. You got seven rings, three, three rounds of trying to stab seven rings. Each uh, rider will be introduced and they'll take a lap around the track. Most of the riders, or a lot of riders, own their own lances, but any lance that a rider's gonna use, he has to bring them back right here, and anybody has the opportunity to use that particular lance. It's good enough for me, it's good for somebody else. I'm riding with this green lance here from uh, a board from my buddy. It's a little lighter than I like, but it, it, it's closer to what I like in my hands. When I hold it, it it's real agile. I can, I can control it real good. Um, it's not so heavy that it wants to go down all the time. This one's been doing good for me so far, so I'm gonna stick with it, kind of superstitious. I don't, I don't like to break tradition with that. And then when I come out for practice, I warm my horse up the same way every time. So from their standpoint, if you're consistent with them, they'll always perform consistent with you. So that I try and be consistent for my horse. Uh, I'm actually an agriculture teacher at a high school in Opelousas, and uh, it's just something I grew up having an interest in. We hunt, we fish, we ride horses, just kind of Almost living off the land. My, my family, some of my cousins grew up doing it, so it's uh, something I always had an interest in. And some of my friends, we all got old enough at the same time. And uh, so we all just kind of took on doing it. Goodness. 777, and the time's in order. 1308, 1313, 1307. Yep. <laughs> it's going to be a dandy event right here. Now for those of you listening out there, it is not too late to get here. Try to bring the kids out here and enjoy and watch these great animals. I got force of my little boys, they're seven and six right now, I'm trying to teach them to, how to respect animals. And it just to me, it helps you to become a better person in life. You know, it teaches you how to respect people. Oh yeah. It's amazing, you come over here tomorrow after this is all done with, it's just a big empty pasture mm -hmm. with a couple of light poles. <laughs> That's it for the 2010 turn one. The spirit of Mardi Gras is one of playful irony, where the social order of things is turned on its head. A time where boundaries of daily life dissolve, if only for a day. A time to remember, to reconnect to ancestors, to a shared heritage, and to each other. Slam dunk. So we call a Mardi Gras song, uh, the dance de Mardi Gras, and you hear it all day long. If you don't know the words, you'll learn it. <laughs> The captain uses this flag 
to signal the Mardi Gras it's time to charge into the house. And every year, the flag comes back. And it's passed on to, to whoever the next captain is. Captain, Captain, voyage to flag, I lost your lot of buzzing. Monday, my shoddy day, who's on the land? The captain's in charge, and they have to they have to keep the order, keep the peace. That's the Mardi Gras, the Grand Mamou. Pati Mamou, no, Grand Mamou. It's hard to tell where Mardi Gras started. It's been there all the time. It's been, as, as long as there's been anyone in, excuse me, any Europeans in Louisiana, <laughs> there's been a Mardi Gras here. But uh, of course, it comes from Europe much longer than that. You know, it's ancient. Parts of it are pre-Christian. It's hooked in with the Catholic calendar. You know, and so we're at Mardi Gras Day, and we're about to, you know, on the verge of starting Lent, which is a 40-day period of uh, sacrifice. So the sacrifice today is going to be the chickens <laughs> and the horses. The horses have to give a big sacrifice today. They got to make the route, you know? and I hope they're smarter than the Mardi Gras riders. <laughs> They're good horsemen, but the horses sometimes are smarter than the riders. <laughs> the captain's going to have to ask. They ask politely if they can come, and then they act unpolitely. <laughs> they ride down on the farmstead, and the farmer gives them a chicken, and they'll, they'll chase the chicken all out in the fields and all that, catch it. That's part of the fun. <laughs> To see the younger the younger people still doing it, we have some guys that run that's 50 years old. We have, you know, the the guys who lie by their age so they can come and run. You know? Centered in the community, Mardi Gras is typically closed to outsiders, but the sheer spectacle of revelers on horseback draws audiences from beyond Louisiana. However, the one aspect of Louisiana's horse play that has harnessed the most attention is horse racing. Over 70,000 professional races have been won by Cajun and Creole jockeys through the years. This is my bobblehead of Super Saver and Mind That Bird, Calvin Borrell. This comes from Churchill Downs. This has Calvin on it. Super Saver, third Kentucky Derby winner. Down here we have a Kentucky Oaks glass, autographed. This is a Breeders' Cup hat. This is at Mammoth Park. And his goggles, of course, he autographed us when he came for the Christmas parade. My name is Diane Borrell. I'm married to Carol Borrell, brother to Calvin Borrell. I'm Carol Borrell from Catahoula. Calvin is my little brother. Coming from such a small place, from a family who had hardly anything, who worked for everything they got, it's a dream come true. He keeps saying unbelievable. Well, it is, yeah. His dad was a sugarcane farmer. Calvin drove the tractor, pulled the potatoes. Everyone did their share and went to school and came home and worked or didn't go to school and worked. He was more, you know, ride, want to ride than us, you know. That's how I guess that's what he liked, because he was used to ride that little horse chalet, we call chalet. He used to run him back and forth in the pasture. You know, we play cowboy engine with the horses. We used to ride the pigs sometimes. <laughs> oh yeah, and the goats, oh yeah. We catch them and ride them. Then the cows. Yeah, you ride that tire, you know, they got a, you got a tire on the side, you used to ride on there like a horse <laughs> when we go to the track when he couldn't, you know, when he was small, watching the races, you know, that's what he wanted to do, right? That's all he did in the house too, he rode the sofas. Oh yeah, on each end. Oh, he was bad. <laughs> he liked that. That's the main thing that he wanted to do. He had told us, he says, Diane, I want y'all to come to the Derby. I said, why? He said, well, he said, I'm gonna win the Derby. You know, we never went there before, you know. Feel like a king. 
Calvin called us the morning on the way back. He says, I have something better than that. Going to the White House, I said, what? <laughs> White House where? He says, the White House. I'm going to meet the Queen and have dinner with the President. I'm so blessed. You know, it's unbelievable. I got a beautiful wife and mom and dad that love me. I got family. All my family loves me. So they're very happy for me. I could die tomorrow and I'm happy. I mean, I, I did more than I ever accomplished. You know, like I said, my dream was to ride the Derby, much less win three out of four. They are in the gate. And they're off in the Kentucky Derby. And Saturday is right there. On the far outside, Great Hunter is launching a bit. He's moving wide as they approach the top of the stretch. And it is Street Sense with a huge move on the far turn. And Calvin Burrell saving ground every step of the way. But it's hard spun to catch as they come off the turn. About 40 yards from the wire, I knew I was going to win. And I kind of caught my head, you know, and not paying attention to the race. And the ground was shaking. I'll never forget telling my wife that the ground just shook, shook, shook. When I stood up, it shook, you know. And then finally I caught my head, you know, and looked in the grandstand and said, God, oh, what a feel. I mean, uh, I had goosebumps. This is probably the greatest moment of my life. Calvin, you've won over 4,000 races, but this is your first Kentucky Derby. What are your feelings? I just want to take my brother to get me here. I wish my mama and daddy was here. This is the most greatest moment of my life. It's got to be a great feeling with that eighth of a mile to go, knowing you're going to win the Kentucky Derby, a childhood dream for Calvin Burrell. All the glory for Calvin Burrell, the Louisiana Cajun, has found a home in Kentucky. You know, my brother always taught me the shortest way around the racetrack is on the fence, you know. And you're going to live and die by the fence. And they're off in the Kentucky Derby. Regal Ransom and Pioneer of the Nile. I'm very aggressive. You know, when I get on a horse, I ride my race to win. Running hard down the side of the track, and Puzzle comes right there, too. Down toward the inside, coming on through. That is uh, my that bird now is coming on to take the lead as they come down to the finish. And it's spectacular. Spectacular upset. My net bird has won the Kentucky Derby. An impossible result here. My net bird and Calvin Burrell with a huge upset. The second biggest upset in Derby history. Calvin, oh my God. <laughs> I love you, sweetie. He won the Oaks and the Derby. He just said I love you too. My mom and daddy. Who are no longer with us. I was you here. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I can only be here you to see what I accomplished in my life. Ready for the start. And they're off in the Kentucky Derby. On a new French Savage and Frank, Super Saver Calvin Burrell. It helps me to know my horses, you know, and just, I love to get on my horses in the morning. And you get a, you know, like a bind with them, and it, it helps. in the history of horse racing has ever won three of four derbies consecutively. What is your secret? <laughs> we got to keep that to ourselves, baby. <laughs> you know, when I first started, I was about 70 years old in bush tracks. And uh, bush track, I mean, it made me. If you, if you can ride in the bush tracks, believe me, you, you can ride anywhere, you know, because anything goes in the bush track. So you had to be aggressive. You know, you had to, you know, lay it on the line and, and do things where you, you can't do in a recognized track, but and you know if you need it, it's there. Welcome back, LPB fans. We are having a great time watching the film T. Gallo, a Louisiana horse story by filmmaker Connie Castile, who is the director of the Moving Image Arts Film Program at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. I'm John Dennison, your host and a friend of LPB, and we're taking this short break because this is your opportunity to show your support for independent producers in Louisiana like Connie and for the original Louisiana programs that you can count on from your public television station. As a consistent viewer, you know that LPB represents the entire state, and we are Louisiana's only statewide public television network. 
So please show your appreciation for the programs we bring you year round. Make that pledge of financial support to LPB. Just call or text GIVE to 888-769-5000. Join online at lpb.org. Or now you can simply scan that QR code you see on your screen with your smart device. And we want to remind you about the member challenge from generous viewers just like you. Sally Capel, Kathleen Hargrave, George Mowbray, and Deborah Richard of Southwest Louisiana. They are matching dollar for dollar the first $1,500 called in during this program only. Now, this makes your contribution worth twice as much to LPB. We also want to remind you about the special thank you gifts that we have for you for your pledge of support. So let's have a look at them. For a $20 monthly donation, you will receive the T. Gallo Combo that includes two hardcover books, Louisiana Cowboys by Bill Jones and Louisiana Trail Riders by Jeremiah Aries. Plus receive a DVD of the program you are watching, T. Gallo, A Louisiana Horse Story. This director's cut DVD includes 20 extra minutes of bonus footage not included in this broadcast. For a $10 monthly donation, receive the book Louisiana Cowboys by Bill Jones, an illustrated account of trail drives throughout the grasslands of southwest Louisiana. And for $7 per month, receive a DVD of the director's cut of T. Gallo, A Louisiana Horse Story, with 20 minutes of bonus footage. Or choose not to receive a gift to let 100% of your donation go to support LPB. Become a friend of LPB today by calling or texting GIVE to 888-769-5000, give online at lpb.org, or simply scan the QR code on your screen with your smart device. Thank you for supporting LPB. And, and we make it so easy for you to give. We appreciate it. Now, Connie, I'm bringing back in Connie Castile, the filmmaker, and Jeremiah Aries, the photographer. Connie, even for those of us who know a little bit about the culture and traditions of Louisiana, uh, we're learning just so much, so much that I didn't know, and I was a lifelong resident. This must have been a real labor of love for you. It was definitely love. Labor, I don't know, it wasn't too hard to hop on those trail rides. And uh, of course, interviewing all the wonderful people from the Cajun jockeys, participating in, in you know, their traditions. They were so welcoming, you know, and, and I mean, that's kind of one of the beautiful things of being a documentary filmmaker is you kind of get to be somebody else for a little while. Uh, normally those, you know, it's not part of your culture, so those things are typically not available to you. But um, they were they were very uh, generous with their time and their stories, and it, it was a it was a lot of fun. I'm glad that they are sharing this lore that's been passed down from generation to generation. I mean, uh, my grandfather homesteaded in uh, Iowa, so right there on the prairie. I loved uh, almost immediately in the documentary, you're, you're explaining the importance of the prairie land in Southwest Louisiana like this. And it immediately brought back memories uh, from being around that property. And I have, uh, I have a cousin who was a pro rodeo rider. They are into cattle, they are into horses. And it was very, very personal for me as I'm sure it is for many Louisianans who've grown up in that same sort of atmosphere. Um, Jeremiah, have you kept in touch with any of the riders that you photographed? Yeah, there are a number of riders I've been in touch with. And, you know, when I've tried, uh, uh, when I've done exhibitions, I've tried to bring uh, some of the riders to be a part of that so that they have an opportunity to share their stories, to uh, talk about their cultural traditions. As, as a photographer, I can talk about making my photographs and what I've learned, but I, I, I find it's really important to be able to give the people that are pictured in the images a voice. And so I'm grateful for the, the riders that have uh, uh, done that with me over the over the years. I'm so glad that you're staying in touch. I uh, want to remind our viewers now to call or text GIVE to the number on your screen or scan that QR code there or at lpb.org. Uh, LPB, of course, is known for its fantastic raffles. There's a new raffle every season, and this one is particularly important as we go through this pledge drive. And here's a little bit more about why you need to get those tickets now. The future of driving is here. LPB's Win the Wheels raffle accelerates into the 21st century with a Tesla Model 3. 
Hi, my name's Seth Irby, and I'm a proud board member for the Friends of LPB. Join me in supporting LPB and enter the raffle today for your chance to win a Tesla Model 3. Enter for your chance to win this hot, next-generation electric car. Every dollar raised goes to support public broadcasting and provide educational resources in your local community. Purchase a ticket for $50. Buy two and you'll get the third ticket free. You'll also receive LPB's most popular benefit, LPB Passport, giving you unlimited access to the best of PB and LPB on demand. Go online to lpb.org slash raffle or call 888-769-5000. You are helping sustain LPB for the future, which makes you a winner and possibly the owner of a brand new Tesla. And you'd better get those tickets now because the folks at Friends of LPB are telling me that those tickets are going pretty quickly. It's no surprising considering what the prize is. So you'll definitely want those tickets now. And remember, everyone, you're supporting the partnership between LPB and Louisiana filmmakers like Connie. Help us preserve Louisiana culture and film. And for Jeremiah, Louisiana culture and print with that gorgeous book that you have there. And Connie, we thank you for partnering with LPB to present your film. We have one more segment of the film to see, and uh, I'm going to make sure I get this right. This is about bush tracks. What does that refer to? That's correct, bush tracks. Um, I'm sure everybody's kind of now aware of these world-renowned jockeys that win these Kentucky Derbies. Um, well, they had to learn how to ride somewhere, and as little kids growing up on you know rural Acadiana, there were these unsanctioned dirt tracks that um, you know when we say unsanctioned, that means there's nobody kind of uh, there were rules they told me, but they were kind of loose rules. You could pretty much do whatever you wanted. So by the time these young boys were um, of the age that they could now go ride at a sanctioned track like an Evangeline Downs, which I think was the age 16, they they were seasoned riders already. So I think the bush tracks uh, can be credited for why we have these amazing jockeys today. They've launched many a career right here in South Louisiana. Jeremiah, you and Connie share a University of Louisiana at Lafayette connection. Uh, it's UL who published your book, is that correct? That is correct, and I'm really grateful for the, you know, they, they did such a nice job. I think it's a really handsome book, and I'm grateful for the uh, uh, artistic freedom given to me to design the book and the support that they've had throughout its release. Your awards include the 2018 Michael P. Smith Award for documentary, documentary photography from the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. I love speaking to award-winning artists <laughs> from my home state. It warms my heart, the both of you. Uh, before we go back to the program, let's hear once more about the fantastic thank you gifts for pledging. For a $20 monthly donation, you will receive the T. Gallo Combo that includes two hardcover books, Louisiana Cowboys by Bill Jones and Louisiana Trail Riders by Jeremiah Aries. Plus receive a DVD of the program you are watching, T. Gallo, A Louisiana Horse Story. This director's cut DVD includes 20 extra minutes of bonus footage not included in this broadcast. For a $10 monthly donation, receive the book Louisiana Cowboys by Bill Jones, an illustrated account of trail drives throughout the grasslands of southwest Louisiana. And for $7 per month, receive a DVD of the director's cut of T. Gallo, A Louisiana Horse Story, with 20 minutes of bonus footage. Or choose not to receive a gift to let 100% of your donation go to support LPB. Become a friend of LPB today by calling or texting GIVE to 888-769-5000, give online at lpb.org, or simply scan the QR code on your screen with your smart device. Thank you for supporting LPB. And a big thank you to these four people, our member challenge endowment from Sally Capel, Kathleen Hargrave, George Mowbray, and Deborah Richard of Southwest Louisiana. They are proud to support LPB's programming. They are challenging all of you to donate tonight. They're going to match it dollar for dollar. And the first $1,500 called in during this program will make that match. So in effect, this makes your donation worth twice as much to LPB.
So together, we can keep LPB strong. Uh, we have been here, it's hard to believe. Next month will be our 46th anniversary of Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Wow, uh, we're pretty young looking for 46 years. Thank you so much to all of our viewers in Louisiana, as well as those of you who are in Texas, Arkansas, and Mississippi. It does take a region. LPV is known for presenting the best documentaries on TV, and T. Gallo is absolutely one prime example. So turn your viewership into membership and support what you love. Thanks again to Maison Madeleine in Bro Bridge and Pack and Paddle in Lafayette for their generous support. Now back to the program. For over 100 years, rural South Louisiana was dotted with unsanctioned, unrecognized racing tracks. These match tracks served as a breeding ground for world-class jockeys. There was nothing that I would have done. I mean, I quit all sports. I quit baseball, I quit football, I quit everything to, to, to ride race horses. I spent the summer at Mr. BBA Bears, is, is his name, uh, his house, and right next to the, uh, the bush track called Cajun Downs. A friend of mine that's been my friend since then, uh, Calvin Borrell, we, we, we rode every weekend together. We're both 11 years old, and uh, we rode every race together. We rode uh, every Sunday and every match race track that was open. Um, it was just a pure fun and enjoyment of horse racing, period. There was no business side of it, if you will. There was just racing, and I just thank God every day that I was a part of it because I cherish those days, some of the funnest days in my life. I also started from Louisiana, like all of us Cajun guys, and uh, Katie and the Downs, uh, quarter pole, any, anything, any race, any horse, any time. Anything went, there was uh, there was no stewards, no one to uh, to patrol the races, so a lot went on. And I think that's, that, that defines who we are now as Cajun riders. It made us a lot tougher, so that was our, our everyday. We had a passion, that's how we grew passion for it. We didn't watch many sports. Uh, obviously, football players, basketball players were not idols. Our idols were Randy Romero and Eddie Delahousie. That was our idols. They were from our part of the country, and they went out in the world and made it. So that was, we kind of patterned ourselves after those guys there. Me and Alba, Robbie Alvarado were really, really close as kids or whatever. My first race on the bush track was at Acadiana Downs. Garland Godfrey, everybody from Louisiana knows him as Tojo. He said, well, I got a horse for you to ride for the first time. He said, find you some tack. I gather tag from a few people and around the house and stuff like that. And, and as far as the danger, it, it's just you never know what you're going to get on at the bush track. And you never know who's going to be right next to you. You might have Robbie or, or Mark Guidry or, or Shane Sellers, but then you might have some Tom Dick or Harry. You don't even know if they have ever rode a race before. All over the country, people like Louisiana riders because not just to say that we came off of learning on the bush tracks, but I mean, we, we did, and, and people people see that. That's why I think there's a lot of good riders that come. They, we go elsewhere and adapt like very quick because we used to like crazy riding. You know, you get there uh, on a Sunday morning. Uh, you hustle, uh, went around asking people, begging people to ride their horses for two dollars, maybe. You might get two dollars, or might even get stiff for it. You know, so you you learn. You learn so much as a horseman, you know, because we, you know, we, we wrapped horses, um, cleaned many, many, many stalls, then was able to ride. You know, now you're ready to ride after you done cleaned 100 stalls. Uh, but, it, you know, it was all a learning process, and it made you a horseman, you know, in, instead of just a rider. We rode at Karen Crow a lot, Karen Crow Raceways, uh, Claude Joss, Bruce Arts, uh, Derby Downs. Uh, we go to Claymore's. Uh, they had a track in, uh, in Henderson at Pats, Lake Charles, Eunice, uh, we went all over. It was crazy, it was fun crazy. Never, never a moment without a whole bunch of crazy excitement. I'm a cow man. And a real cowboy doesn't have to be born a cowboy. There's cowboys today that are rodeo cowboys and born from the city, ride a bull like a tick. 
but it's a different kind of cowboy than what I am. I was born riding calves. Papa always had cattle. But believe me, you put two cowboys together, one can tell, tell the other one real quick. I'm the real deal. I should have worn my hat. In 1967 or 68, I retired from farming because I wasn't a very good farmer. And we bought a set of racing gates. It held uh, seven horses. And they were set right up between these two oak trees. And I named it Lindsey Downs. My papa was Lindsey Brown. Get him up. No. Way up, Cecil. No. All right, wait a minute. Let me get a circle with the straw. Wait, I don't have no money. Grab you. Okay, I'm ready. Ready? My brother Coon, who's an old jockey from, no, uh, let's see, Coon 74, and he started jockeying in the catch weight, where the lighter the, the jockey is what you wanted. And, and in Bose, his son, he was also light. He was a catch weight jockey. Every Sunday afternoon, I'd go to the races, make my little 50 cents or my dollar, sometimes three. Yeah. I missed a lot of baseball games in the past year, going to make my little dollar, but I did. I didn't know, I really didn't know which one I liked best, but I, the dollar made me make up my mind. Sundays were, were, it was an adventure for us as little boys. Yeah. Daddy was the gate man, and, and the gate man is the most hated person in the track, because if you have four or five horses in a race, only one wins, and it's the gate man's fault. Every time there was a cascara or a, a fight or just a general upheaval, they were always wanting to kill daddy. So we were kind of used to, oh, the coon's gonna have to fight again. But they'd never fight him. He had a bull whip, and he'd crack it. And they'd say, come on, come on, you, you mad? Come on, let's go. Oh, and then they'd kick the dirt. So generally, we were pretty, we were pretty confident that uh, he wasn't gonna get killed today. I watched my daddy smoke about a half a pack of cigarettes in five minutes one time. I was seven years old, just had learned how to ride on a jockey saddle, you know, the little short stirrups. The man came up to me and said, Coon, you let him ride? When he started working those cigarettes. I, I never saw a cigarette burn so fast. I don't know if you want to, and I said, yeah, and he didn't want me to. Uh, ended up riding. A lot of kids my age in this part of Louisiana like to ride horses. A lot of my friends are good riders. The thing I enjoy racing is winning. When I win a race, I really feel good. When I lose a race, I'm not as good, but not real bad. Don't tell me how to ride. I'm how to ride. Let me ride the I mean, my first chew of tobacco was right here. We. We snuck in Cecil's truck and, and stole some red man or something. We climbed on top of this barn and we would chew it and we would spit off the back and watch it drip. And I remember getting sick and, and oh, I said, oh, feel good. I had to go home and Coon brought me home. Y'all probably knew, I don't know. It was, a, it was a fun way to grow up. Some, saw some at seven, eight, ten years old. And it was kind of a hatchery for little jockeys. We had a lot of little jockeys come from this country. Um, Ronald Ardwine, uh, Randy Romero, uh, Eddie Delahousse, Mark Guidry, Calvin, the Louvier boys, the Sam boys. On Friday nights, we'd make a supper, a free supper and uh, people would enter their horses. Cajun people, after they get a few drinks, their horses run faster. And the women are prettier. Somebody said his horse is better than the other one. A lot of money changed hands. We would sell cow cutters on anything with a three horse race or more. Okay, the next heat is gonna be heat number six. We have five horses going a half a mile. We're gonna sell the first horse, Todd B. All right, boys, I'm with sir. I'm gonna get five, it'll be a nine, get ten, sir. At ten, fifteen, I'm gonna get a 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 get a
It was 90% French. Just about everybody spoke French in them days. Blacks and whites. They had rules, but it was not written. If they said catch weight, that meant just as long as you had a jockey on it. If you said no jockey, it meant no jockey. They'd run them with either um, a little uh, beer can with two or three rocks in them to rattle on the horse to make him run faster. Beer cans, chickens. We've been through some, a lot of wild things. This was an open track. It was the beginning of the end of the rails. The rails means a set of wooden planks between each horse to where they don't run into each other. It was the new deal. And from here, if they ran good enough or fast enough, they would go on to Evangeline Downs. Turn that over to the casino because the casino side of the property never, and I mean never, closes. It's open 24-7 every day of the year. Heading out for the early lead with Colonial Jones. Colonial Jones is right there at the back of the leading group in fifth, just a length and a half from the lead. Cherie Cherie behind that leading quintet is in sixth, and it's easy from the gate. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. God bless each and every one of you. And there is. Um, Holy water up there now. Yeah, you. Started riding on the bush tracks when I was, I think, 10 or 11, and um, rode there till I was 16, and then got my uh, license at Evangeline Downs for the recognized track. You know, when I got there, I thought it was a big deal, you know, big time. I uh, rode 15 years in Chicago. I rode four years in Saudi Arabia. Then I came back to uh, Louisiana and um, just stayed here. Uh, had family here and just didn't feel like traveling anymore. It's, it's a shame that uh, the, the bush tracks are no more um, because there was a lot of great, great Cajun riders that um, came on the bush tracks you know, before me. And uh, I think I was probably one of the last ones to come off the bush tracks you know, and ride because after that, they started closing them all down. Actually, me and Mark Guidry, we were kind of talking about maybe opening up a jockey school. I haven't seen too many riders come out of those schools. There's a lot, a lot of things that the Bruce Jacks brought. It didn't just bring um, jockeys. It brought a mentality. Whether or not we'll see another generation of world-class riders like Calvin Burrell, and Hall of Famers Randy Romero, Eddie Delahousse, or Kent Desimo is unknown. The threat of lawsuits and liability spooked track owners. Bush tracks are parking lots and subdivisions now. The mentality bush tracks brought is gone. Well, if you're in front of a Nintendo all day long and a TV all day long and you're not you're not getting your hands dirty, you're not falling and scraping your knees, you're sure not gonna get on the back of a horse. I think the future of all riders from anywhere is in jeopardy because of weights, for one, with nutrition. You're gonna you find a 16-year-old kid to do 112 pounds. They just don't make them anymore. Um, now from that pool of riders that can make 112 pounds or what have you, you gotta get the ones that, that have enough heart to get on them. Basically time, to give something back to the young kids that want to that wanna be able to ride. I mean, you have kids that grew up all around uh, racing. I mean, their father is nothing but racing. Uh, the family's nothing about racing. The mother's nothing about racing. She goes out there at 4 o'clock in the morning, too, works with the father. Uh, the kid just there, you know, he's going to gallop a few horses on the farm, but has nowhere to, to go beyond the galloping and, and, and beyond all that. Personally, 
I think that it would help out a whole lot if they would have somewhere to go, whether it be a bush track or whether it be a riding school, whatever the case may be, you know, to just to hip them up a little bit uh, of what's coming, you know, get the basics all down pat. Thank you, Boo. Oh, that was you? Yeah. I couldn't, hey, when you was hot, I couldn't see nothing. Mud packs every night. That's why we stay so young looking. <laughs> if you believe that, I got a beach to sell you on the bike. Uh, I enjoy looking at the pictures. I know every character in there. Every one of them. And you go back and look at these pictures, and some of them are gone. OK, where I'm standing here is where they had the uh, three horse track. It's a a cemetery now. But them days are gone. We'll never see that again. Never see that again. It's kind of sad looking at this now that it's just a, a pasture from a horses and longhorns. You can sort of still see where the oval part of the old track is. Well, T. Gallo fans, we made it to the finish line. I'm John Dennison, and it's been my pleasure to host this fine film produced by Connie Castile of Lafayette. And I want to tell you, this break is your last, final opportunity in the program to show your support for the great documentaries and the Louisiana-specific programming that you have come to rely on here at LPB. So please pick up that phone, call us, or text GIVE to 888-769-5000. Join or renew your membership online at lpb.org or just scan the QR code that we're now providing on your screen. Just use the camera on your smart device. It only takes a couple of moments, whichever way you choose to give. And your generous donation is going to have a long-term impact, positive impact on LPB. I've been an LPB member for a number of years, have volunteered for about as many, and it's because of the programs on LPB, such as T. Gallo, a Louisiana horse story. And I know that I can count on LPB to broadcast shows about and for Louisiana. And I know I can count on you to show and appreciate your, your uh, love of LPB with your call or text. So click or scan right now. The information's right there on your screen. We are so appreciative to you as we are to Sally Capel, Kathleen Hargrave, George Mowbray, and Deborah Richard of Southwest Louisiana, who are making your contribution worth double to LPB, but only through the end of this break for only a few more minutes. So we need you to call right now. This is also the time when you can choose thank you gifts for whatever giving level works best for you and your budget. So let's take a look at those gifts right now. 
For a $20 monthly donation, you will receive the T. Gallo Combo that includes two hardcover books, Louisiana Cowboys by Bill Jones and Louisiana Trail Riders by Jeremiah Aries. Plus receive a DVD of the program you are watching, T. Gallo, A Louisiana Horse Story. This director's cut DVD includes 20 extra minutes of bonus footage not included in this broadcast. For a $10 monthly donation, receive the book Louisiana Cowboys by Bill Jones, an illustrated account of trail drives throughout the grasslands of southwest Louisiana. And for $7 per month, receive a DVD of the director's cut of T. Gallo, A Louisiana Horse Story, with 20 minutes of bonus footage. Or choose not to receive a gift to let 100% of your donation go to support LPB. Become a friend of LPB today by calling or texting GIVE to 888-769-5000, give online at lpb.org, or simply scan the QR code on your screen with your smart device. Thank you for supporting LPB. And thank you again to Connie Castile and Jeremiah Aries for joining me in the breaks tonight during our program. Connie, this has been such a special opportunity for LPB to air this. Tell me what last thoughts you have about the, the cowboy culture in Louisiana as we come to a close. Well, I want to first thank LPB for broadcasting it. You know, the film came out in 2012 and um, you don't, you know, we shouldn't take any traditions for granted. So I'm hoping that the Creole trail rides are still vibrant. Uh, we clearly lost bush tracks, so I'm not sure where our next generation of Cajun jockeys are going to be coming from. But um, hopefully they'll continue that tradition as well. And um, just having, I mean, we, we make documentaries to be shown and so these stories can be shared. So I'm so happy that it's being broadcast here. I'm glad that we are continuing to share it. And for something that was made a few years ago, it seems as fresh as it was filmed yesterday. And that is a true credit to the director and the filmmaker herself. Jeremiah, your photographs of the writers, they've gotten a tremendous response. That must be very gratifying for you. It is really gratifying. And I'm grateful for the awards the work has received, but really all the accolades go to the, to the writers themselves. But you bring them so vividly to the pages of your book. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> give yourself a little more credit there. <laughs> you have obviously the skills in which to present those gorgeous photographs of this wonderful culture. Well, thank you. Thank you. It was a labor of love. Okay. That, see, that's what I always hear from people who are making art, that it is indeed a labor of love. And even Connie said, maybe not so much a labor because it's more love. Um, <laughs> I want you to know that Louisiana Public Broadcasting, in addition to asking you your support during this program tonight, look at the ways you can pledge there on your screen. We also can get your support through our annual raffles. And the raffle that is going on right now, and tickets are going fast, is one very important to us. Let's have a look. The future of driving is here. LPB's Win the Wheels raffle accelerates into the 21st century with a Tesla Model 3. Hi, I'm Trisha Johnson, and I'm the winner of the 2021 Win the Wheels Raffle. Enter for your chance to win this hot, next-generation electric car. Every dollar raised goes to support public broadcasting and provide educational resources in your local community. Purchase a ticket for $50. Buy two, and you'll get the third ticket free. You'll also receive LPB's most popular benefit, LPB Passport, giving you unlimited access to the best of PBS and LPB on demand. Go online to lpb.org slash raffle or call 888-769-5000. Can't win if you don't enter. I love my new Tesla. Thank you, friends of LPB. You are helping sustain LPB for the future, which makes you a winner and possibly the owner of a brand new Tesla. Buy just three tickets and you'll become a member of LPB Passport so that whenever you want to go in and look at some of the fine programming over the decades that we've aired, you have the ability to do that at your fingertips. And uh, also, in addition to um, becoming passport, a, a passport member, you'll get Visions, our monthly program guide, 
full of all the program listings and that month's news from LPB. And you'll also get a subscription to Louisiana Life Magazine, which is such a treasure in our state. You're supporting the partnership between LPB and Louisiana filmmakers. So help us preserve Louisiana culture and film by making your donation now. Connie, tell us about, uh, you have an upcoming project. I believe it's called The Quiet Cajuns. Well, that's correct. That sounds like an oxymoron to me. <laughs> I know, huh? Uh, it's interesting. It, it's going to be a, a story about a, a subculture of Acadians, um, the deafblind Cajuns that um, um, or you, the Acadian Usher syndrome is a genetic quirk amongst the Acadians, um, and you're born profoundly deaf, and you start to lose your vision around puberty. So um, we look at two generations, an older um, gentleman who um, kind of grew up without even hearing tests when he was born, right? So um, having resources and uh, we're and even technology to help uh, with vision loss or hearing was just not available. So we, we see that beautiful deaf culture. And then we have a younger uh, generation that um, has a Cadian usher, but um, has access to cochlear implant. And, and so he's kind of immersed and assimilated into the hearing world, but the blindness is um, pending. So it, it's, a, um, it's a beautiful way to kind of share this part of our Acadian culture that we, we don't think about or we didn't even know about, at least for me, when I, when I learned about the Acadian Usher, which is why I wanted to make this film. And we look forward to premiering that film soon on LPB. Jeremiah, uh, first of all, thank you reminding our viewers that you are signing those books so that they'll get a nice autographed book <laughs> when they make their pledge. And uh, I also understand you're going to be profiled coming up soon on Art Rocks, that's LPB's weekly series on Louisiana artists, airing Fridays at 8.30 in the evening and Saturday afternoons at 5.30. And, uh, you know, do you have any projects in the works coming up? Well, I'm always working on a number of things, and I have a, a new project of photographs I've been making in the battleground states of the country up uh, prior to the last presidential election and in the days since, and that's going to be opening wow. up in yeah, Nashville a, coming a up in a couple weeks. political photo book, that should go over well in a state <laughs> like Louisiana, where we have such a rich political history. Well, congratulations yeah. on that, and we look forward to your future work as well as Connie's. And before we go back, uh, before we go, so let's get uh, one more look at our thank you gifts for making your pledge. For a $20 monthly donation, you will receive the T. Gallo Combo that includes two hardcover books, Louisiana Cowboys by Bill Jones and Louisiana Trail Riders by Jeremiah Aries. Plus receive a DVD of the program you are watching, T. Gallo, A Louisiana Horse Story. This director's cut DVD includes 20 extra minutes of bonus footage not included in this broadcast. For a $10 monthly donation, receive the book Louisiana Cowboys by Bill Jones, an illustrated account of trail drives throughout the grasslands of southwest Louisiana. And for $7 per month, receive a DVD of the director's cut of T. Gallo, A Louisiana Horse Story, with 20 minutes of bonus footage. Or choose not to receive a gift to let 100% of your donation go to support LPB. Become a friend of LPB today by calling or texting GIVE to 888-769-5000, give online at lpb.org, or simply scan the QR code on your screen with your smart device. Thank you for supporting LPB. A, gr a great big shout out to Connie and Jeremiah for joining me this evening. Thank you to all of you viewers as well, and a thank you to Maison Madeleine and Bro Bridge, as well as Pack and Paddle and Lafayette for their generous support of LPB. Indeed, it does take a village for our public television in Louisiana. And I'm John Dennison. Thanks so much for joining us. Good night.